everybody. <laughs> How are you all doing? Yeah, he's not the host. I'm not the host. It's this guy. Right here. I just wanted to. I just wanted to say hi. <laughs> yes, I am the host. So welcome to our panel. Thank you for spending your Saturday morning when you were probably hungover or tired or something. I know I am. <laughs> hungover or tired? Uh, not yet. Not yet. All right, fair you enough. You weren't here yesterday, so you don't get to complain. I don't. I don't. <laughs> so who here is interested in working part time on games? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Whoa. Who here is planning on doing it in the near future? Yeah. Who here already does it? Awesome. <laughs> okay, this is All pretty right. good. So I'm going to just run down the line. We're going to ask a few questions. We're going to try to leave a good amount of time at the end for you guys to ask questions. I'm sure you got lots. Then afterwards, I'm going to be probably standing out there in the lobby, and I'm not going anywhere. I got no plans for today. <laughs> so my name is Ket. I I've got one failed project to my name, and I'm working with this gentleman right here, Kalen, on a project called Alicorn Princess Blast, a pony shooting game. So I've got a little bit of experience of what not to do, moonlighting, and I want to pass it down to John, you're next. Hi, I'm John Combs. I'm the design director for Uber Entertainment, and the um, reason why I'm on the panel is I make games during the day and uh, on, by myself at night. So I kind of <laughs> do both, and... Uh, Uber is one of the many companies that actually allows their employees to we all own whatever we do in our own spare time. So I make games during the day, and then whatever I do, as long as I don't use Uber's time and equipment, um, I do my own thing at night. All right. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Kalen Norman Slack. Um, I'm, a, I'm a recent graduate from the University of Washington, and um, I work during the day as a telephone service representative. And at night, I uh, I make games along with Cat and a group of like you know 16, 17 other people. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Fred Wan. I'm by day I'm a trial lawyer. Uh, by night I work for a tabletop game called Legend of the Five Rings. I'm their narrative designer. I'm Paul Barclay. Uh, by day I run a game company called Dragon Foundry. By night I run a game company called Dragon Foundry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're a mix of full-time and part-time game developers, so a little different setup from big studios or small indies. Cool. Okay. So, what are your goals going down the line of working part-time? Like, some of you obviously have full-time jobs doing games. Do you want to split off and start new companies, or do you want to just keep as a part-time hobby thing? Or so, what are your plans, like your goals as a part-time moonlighter? Well, mine, since I make games all day, it's not because I want to make games. Well, I do want to make <laughs> games, but I already make games. Uh, but the side goals are I want a creative outlet. You know, the games that we make at Uber, I spend a year, year and a half, sometimes two years working on the same project. And having a side project allows me to flex my creative muscles, as it were. And um, when I finish one, if I sell it, then I can buy cool things for me and my family, which is awesome. <laughs> Um, my goal, uh, my side goal, is generally to just try to find uh, find ways, new tools, new methods to better my own craft. Um, it's also it's also very much to have a creative outlet as well. Oh, I should face the mic when I'm talking. Um, it's also to have a creative outlet as well, but it's mostly to just kind of you know, figure out ways to kind of play with my craft and then become better at it. I want to reach people. I I like having a way to express myself. Um, there are some ideas I want to share, and I happen to be good at speaking through uh, words, and games are one way to get those ideas out there. Would I like to, I'd like to work on a video game at some point. I haven't yet, but at the same time, creative openings are pretty rare in the game industry, and ones for someone who's not doing it full-time are even rarer. And for us, it's about building something that's bigger than we could build on our own. We're a decent sized team, eight to 10 people, depending on time of year, time of day. Um, and we can't hire everybody full time. So being able to bring in people who are part timers and moonlighting is really great for bringing in some really special skills, um, getting insight from people we could never hire full time because they have amazing jobs at other places. So, 
So this is more for the people that aren't already full-time in games, but how do you want to make the jump? Like, what's, do you have a plan? Do you want to just like make your own, like, what, how do you plan to make the jump to full-time if you're trying to do that? It's only two of us. Oh, for, for, for Kalen? Is that for me? Oh, it's yeah. me. Let me, let me think about that for a second. Don't hurt yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my widow head! <laughs> I knew I should have bought a binky for this panel. Uh, so maybe Fred. Fred, do you want to start off? I'm the... We just met, so I hope he knows that was a joke. No, I know. <laughs> it's a joke. Um, it's tricky because if you're working part-time and gaming is your part-time job, then something else is your full-time job. And if you're looking at switching over, it has to be, you have to think about things like security, how good are you at it, how much money will you make, uh, what kind of career path there is, and so on. And like, I, I think I'm at the point where if I wanted to, I've, I've been working on L5R for 10 years. The game's just celebrated its 20th at Gen Con this year. And it's difficult to come up with a kind of realistic job that someone would offer me in the games industry that could compete. At the same time, if someone said, here's this dream project, do you want to do it? I would totally say, I'll think about it. But, but that's the thing, right? Like, no, like, it's all very well and good to say, I will definitely make the leap. It's not always realistic, and you need to reflect on what you're looking for, what you need. Uh, do you have other obligations, be they financial, social, whatever? And it's something I think about, but at the same time, there isn't that offer there waiting. And it's not like I hate, like, unlike a lot of people, I don't hate my day job. I enjoy it. So it's easy if you know for sure there's one thing you want. And if that's that, and if gaming is that thing, chase it. Chase it, chase whatever that is that you want with all your passion and all your energy because it's totally worth it. If there's more than one thing in your life that really brings you meaning, then you have a harder path because you need to reflect on it more. And in some cases, if you have more than one passion, you can't follow them all fully at the same time. That's absolutely true. I would, I would add to that, look at some other creative fields. Look at acting, look at musicians. Most people, as they're coming into that, they have a day job, they're working on the side, trying to perfect their craft, really get into the industry, and some people, some people make it big, some people just have a ton of fun doing it on the side, just purely for fun. They're both great ways of doing things. Um, let's see. It's definitely about, um, from my own personal perspective, it's definitely about finding a balance between that, having that creative outlet and then the security of knowing that you're going to be able to pay your bills. Um, one of the things that I've always heard uh, when attending panels like these and listening to other designers is I've always heard to never really be just a designer. Uh, be a programmer, be a musician, have something other that produces some sort of physical asset that others can look at. Um, I'm still kind of like working out as to why, because there's a myriad of reasons, but it is a good idea. And how that really aligns with my own personal goals is uh, for making that leap, I wanted to use the skills that I'm gaining, uh, use the skills that I'm gaining as a part of the side work that I do and as a part of whatever jobs that I take on to sort of angle myself in a way that I can be happy with. Sorry, that's, that was kind of a weird leap for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I'm good. So I, I wanna agree with what he just said. Um, I don't actually agree with pick one thing and make do that one thing. Um, I've been building games professionally for 14 years now, and the people that are much more useful in the industry are the ones that can do multiple things. Um, 
the whole idea that you're either really good at one thing or you're mediocre at a bunch of things is a bunch of bullshit. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, you can be good at a whole bunch of things. The reason why that whole thing comes up is because of games, because things have to be fair. You can't have a wizard that's good at fighting with swords too because it's overpowered. But in real life, you can be good at everything. So when I look at designers, well, my, myself, I got in the industry because I'm a designer who knows how to code and I can do art. And that has helped me in my career. So when I hire designers, I look at designers who are fantastic designers and decent engineers because those are way more useful to us. If you do one thing and do it really well, you're limiting yourself to only the bigger studios if you ever want to get into actually making games because only at the bigger studios do people do one thing. Right. You know, the small company like Uber were 24 people. You know, everybody wear, wears multiple hats. And most people are very good at more than one thing. Because when everything gets down to it, like, once you get past that, you know, design phase where everybody's like, you know, here's, our, here's some cool ideas, like, sometimes those other skills, like, can really come in handy. And they play off of each other all the time. Um, one of the things I love about being a designer that, can, that knows how to do code is I'll be struggling with a design and I'll start looking through the code, you know, even seeing how Unity does things, and I'll be like, oh, I can bend that rule, and oh, I can break that rule really easily, <laughs> and I can build an entire game mechanic around it because it was easy to implement. In most jobs, in and outside of gaming, you need to be able to solve problems and accomplish things. Yes. That is a, that's a broader skill set than I can do this. I, I do narrative work, but I work with our CCG design team. There are times where I will say, for story reasons or flavor reasons, we need to get this across. Here are some suggestions on how to do it mechanically without wrecking the game. And if I was not literate in straight CCG design, it would be harder for the design team to implement the suggestions because I couldn't give them examples in their language. And times when they push back and say, well, we can't do that, as a narrative guy, I have to be able to evaluate whether or not they're just pushing me off or if there's a legitimate mechanical stress point. And you can't do that as an ultra, ultra specialist. And a lot of, right now, the part-time jobs are in smaller companies where you have to wear more hats. So he's, exact, he's exactly right. Right. And it's very easy to point out what's wrong. It's a whole lot easier to point out how to fix it. Right. And that's yeah. speaking of exactly what you just said. So, I guess switching around. So, since you're talking a little bit about you need to have lots of be able to wear many hats. If as a as a head of a small studio, what do you look for if you're looking at a, a bring it back to the uh, as a moonlighter? If someone's doing that, how do you bring them on either as a moonlighter or maybe bring them on from moonlighting to full time? What do you look for? How do you select somebody? What makes you want to hire somebody? I look for finish. Um, it's really, really easy to start a game. Um, it's easy to get the game halfway done. It's easy to get a game three, three quarters of the way done. Um, it's really, really hard to finish. And that's what separates the, the fun part-time game maker from a professional, is somebody who can actually finish, have something that is plausibly shippable, and understands that what you're building is more than just a game. It is a product. So you have to think about how does it fit in the marketplace? How does it fit which platform it goes on? And that kind of stuff is really key, making the leap from somebody who does it moonlighting on their part-time to becoming a full-time professional game developer, in my opinion. I could yeah, be wrong. I, I go even a little further than that. I look for people who have finished more than one product on teams uh, of at least two or three. If you finish a product on your own, you, you definitely, you can make a game, but it doesn't prove that you can work with other people and m work on a smallish team of 10 people. So we really, we need people who can work with other people. If you've put a game together with a couple of friends, that you're on the way to proving that and you can execute. Um, we also look at people who are really self-directed. We've got a lot of part-timers. We're a virtual studio, so we don't, have, we don't have offices at the moment. So we need people who are out there um, doing the work that they, 
that are assigned and they've picked up, and we know that they will just get it done. So that's, that's a, another piece of a skill set. Really, really important. Finishing games is a great indicator of, um, of that. Um, and interviewing well is another, another way of figuring that out. Well, so to switch tact a little bit, when you're working on your games, how do you stay focused and stay motivated? Because especially if you're doing games at your day job, I can have to imagine there's days where you come home and you don't particularly feel like working on more games. How do you like keep going, or like that last 25% of the game that's just not fun? How do you <clears> keep motivated and keep work, working on your free time that you could be doing anything else? Well, um, I have two kids at home. A five-year-old and a seven-year-old, which makes it even harder, which is interesting. So I do all my work um, after my wife and kids go to sleep. So I'm in my office all by myself. And I find that two things help me the most. One is having a deadline. Like, I want to get in this UI system by the end of the week. And that helps. The other one is, because I do work on games all day, um, I play a lot of League of Legends. <laughs> so luckily the queue times can be rather long sometimes. So I do, <laughs> I'll have Unity in the background behind <laughs> League of Legends and then when I'm sitting in queue, I'll be working on stuff, working on stuff and then it pops up and I join the game and then because I suck at the game, I die a lot and then while I'm dead, <laughs> I work on the game then. <laughs> And then I get yelled at because I didn't move right away and people thought I was, no, I don't really take it that far. Well, I actually do sometimes. <laughs> okay. But yeah, that's how I, I kind of mix, I, I mix up the stuff I'm doing fun along with putting deadlines on, ourself, on myself. And yeah, that's, that's how I get through it. Uh, keeping up morale and keeping motivated when working on something, especially if it's a personal project, is actually really, really difficult. Um, if, if you're like starting out for the first time, it gets easier as you go along because then you kind of develop ways to keep yourself motivated. But um, some of the ways that I keep myself motivated when working on Alicorn Princess Blast is um, it's, it's an interesting kind of thing. I often end up looking back at the old design document, um, which is odd because there's a whole discussion around that. But um, I usually end up looking back at the old design documents and kind of reading through it and looking for what the original point of the game was and then looking for how that correlates with how the game, how the alpha builds and how the beta builds or whatever have been received. And then um, there are sometimes, there can sometimes be interesting things you find that kind of, uh, that kind of jump starts your brain into thinking of different ways to hit on certain points. Like if your game is, you know, trying to be a new kind of roguelike and you have a beta build out and a lot of the feedback you get while you know giving you feedback that's critical um, some of them are genuinely positive and they think the game's cool and they want to buy it when it comes out that's something that can actually kind of jumpstart your brain and be like okay you know this is actually kind of cool um, that's one way uh, another way is just kind of keeping your eyes on the prize um, keeping your eyes on the end goal uh, not only what the product's going to do itself but what you want out of the product um, I could keep going, but I might, be, I might ramble, so next. <laughs> um, we have publishing deadlines because we bring out regular short stories and my role is to review, give feedback to the authors, polish as necessary and so on, and they go out with my name on them. And I care about the quality of the work I produce. Um, I don't know how much you might know about Legend of the Five Rings, but one of our big kind of unique things is players have a say in what happens in stories. So if someone wins an event, they will have a right of input into the narrative. And I want to make sure that every single person who's shown up in an event, and particularly people who've walked away with a prize, feel like I have given them their due. So a lot of it is kind of love of the craft and a desire to kind of give back to a game that I was a fan of before I worked on it. But it can be hard after a day in front of the computer, looking at documents, turning on the computer, and rather than playing LOL, looking at more Word documents. I'd still play LOL. Well, uh, so but do I'm I, I'm bad actually, like that, I'm but, bad like that. But it is important if you're doing something that takes up a significant, significant, a significant part of your time that you are motivated to do it. And that actually does help you decide if you want to work in this business or not. Do you enjoy it? 
or does it feel like a drain on your soul? Because a lot of people say they want to work on games because games, fun, right? Working on a product is not the same thing as using it. And Still a job, too. Yeah. And all the wonderful things that go along with it being a job. Yeah, and there are obligations to your consumer base, to your coworkers, and so on. And if you find that takes away from you, that is something you have to factor in. Like, the sad truth is there are people who hate their jobs at whatever jobs they do. And sometimes the other rewards are worth it. And other people love their jobs. And, and you need to think about how that interacts with games if you want to work in gaming. So, so let's say you've thought about all those things and you've said, yes, this is still exactly right for me. You still have to keep your motivation up. There's a few uh, tricks that big studios use that you can use as well. Um, we're, we're working in an agile development methodology. Um, it's amazing for keeping morale up because we're working on very small goals and we have to hit the goal every week and keep moving. If you, if you hit the goal, you always see progress. You can, you're always working on the same things that you're, the whole team is working on. Um, there's some really good tools out there that are totally free that you can use. Um, Trello, uh, tr Trello, Trello, Asana, Asana, Pivotal Tracker. So you might want to quickly explain what Agile is. So Agile is, rather than saying at the start of a project, this is exactly what we're going to build. We're going to build a water bottle. Um, what you say is, here are some pieces of features that people, cus customers might like that they want. The features I like is I like to get water, because otherwise I'm not going to be able to talk anymore. So it's a way of breaking down what you're building into very small chunks and then keeping on looking at what you're building and saying, oh, the customers actually want different things to a water bottle. They, they, what they really want is just to get water. So what, what, what we actually are going to move towards and end up building is a drinking fountain with flashing lights and prizes and all kinds of crazy things. Uh, because what, that's, that's what, as we've built the game and we've continued to look at how people are interacting with it and playing it, that's what people actually wanted. So it, it's a way of making sure you don't build the wrong thing. It's a way of making sure you're only focusing on what really matters to you, which is incredibly important for finishing a game, especially if you're a two-person indie team working part-time, so you've maybe got 10, 15 hours a week to work. Um, but the, the real benefit of it for small indie teams is it, it, it gives you that feeling of progress. Like It's almost like you're playing through an RPG of making a game, um, and you're just doing you're just finishing a, a quest every week. And you'll, you'll both end up with a better game out of it, and you'll, you'll keep enjoying it um, through the whole process, and you'll be in more sync with your teammates, because you'll be talking about what you're doing and how you're doing it every single week, and making sure that everybody's on the same page. There is something I wanted to mention too uh, about deadlines. Thank you for thank you for mentioning deadlines. Because <laughs> there's a part that I wanted to say. Um, what's interesting about working on Alicorn Princess Blast is that it's mostly a volunteer team. So no one's really getting paid to work on this. And so everybody else kind of has day jobs. And so how that kind of breaches into like setting deadlines for yourself, because it's really hard when you when you don't really have that kind of fire under you. What most what we have found that tends to work, and I've talked to other people about it too, is convention to convention. So like you look for con dates, and then you try to get something out by that con date. Um, and especially if you register for the con and you have to show something at the con, that really gets a fire under you to get it done. That's kind of like the the deadline thing I mentioned earlier. Yeah, like kind just, of. You know, and when I said you know I give myself a deadline to you know have this UI piece in by the end of the week, that's directly talking to the agile method. Right. Um, you know, just small chunks. And one of the things that is really beneficial to even to si somebody the size of Uber is every week the whole company gets to see visual progress in the game. If you use the other method, which is called waterfall, sometimes it'd be like, oh yeah, this system's coming on three months from now, so we have no idea how it's going to be because that's when it lines up exactly on the schedule. It's great for building, you know, products like water bottles, actually. 
um, that you know exactly what it's going to be. But in a creative de endeavor like a video game, you don't know what it's exactly it's going to be, and you got to kind of suss it out. And Agile works really, really well for that. And then to go a, a tiny bit, a tiny bit deeper. Um, I mean, if you decide to actually look up Agile, there's like two forms of it. I mean, uh, when I was in school, I ended up learning of both Scrum, which I think a lot of software devs use, and then there's also Kanban. Um, Kanban is more like, you know, working on a conveyor belt where everybody has a specific piece to contribute, and then Scrum is kind of, you get an assignment, you, you meet together, figure out what you're going to do next, go out and do it, and then come back at the end of the week or sprint, and then just meet together, and then kind of do the same thing again. And that actually speaks to that visual progress as well. Yeah. And any of those agile methods, you can, we, we bastardize it and change it, just to yeah. make whatever works for you. Um, one thing I want to touch on, I've heard people, proponents of using Agile plus Waterfall in conjunction of getting to a point where you need to make lots of progress and doing the Waterfall method to try to burn through, finish a component, and then switch back to Agile. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think that's somebody trying to shoehorn the term waterfall into Agile. That's okay. what like, it feels like to me. Because yeah, it's like those are two completely different methods of approaching a project. Yeah. I mean, you can, uh, and over the course of one sprint, you can say, you know, in the next week, this is what we're going to do and this is the order going to get done. And technically, that's a mini waterfall. But when I say waterfall, usually it's like we're going to plan out the next two years and know exactly mm. when everything's going to come online. The first year is going to be design, and, and then you, the second year is going to be. Yeah. A lot of times when you hear big companies that have been building a game for three years, it's because they're trying, normally it's because they're trying to use that method and they spend all this time and then they get to a point and say, wow, this game is terrible. We need to ditch it and do something different. And so they ditch it, and then they plan out the next year. And at the end of that year, they realize it's terrible again. And that's very often how these big, long games fall apart. And so the Agile method works better, and it should work better for you when you're working on games on the side, because it's just the quick turnaround rate is so much better for a creative process. Otherwise, you get Duke Nukem forever. <laughs> yeah, we, <laughs> that did ship. That's not it, did it did ship after 15 years, yeah. something. I've I've seen other people. I mean, it's not just for game making as well. I've seen other people who do other different types of endeavors also use agile. There's an artist that I know um, who I I believe he uses Kanban. He uses Trello, but I looked at his Trello board and it's just all of these different tasks outlined. Um, he's he's really organized and. Um, what that generally correlates with is he has a lot of output, so there's something on his DeviantArt account like almost every day, just because he's so organized. <laughs> so what do you do if you're a, not an organized person? Not everybody is super organized. Right. <clears throat> you do the same thing that you do if you're not an artist. Go out, find someone to work with who has those skill sets. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's back up a little bit. So as I understand, so Uber and Dragonforge are both really good about letting people do their own projects on their time. If you're trying to get into the industry, what do you look for in your company? Because not all companies are going to be that generous, or I won't call it generous, but open to letting you do your own projects. So how do you treat that? Do you just not work for some places? Do you have to compromise? I think it depends on what your goals are. If your goals are to be a game developer and work in the industry as a professional, then get your foot in the door. You know, If you have to sacrifice doing a side project for a year or two, then do it. But if your goal is to just make games and you don't care how you do it, then be a little bit more picky. Especially if you have the financial resources to not have to have a job. Then you know, do whatever you want. Yeah, then do what you want. <laughs> yeah, then do what you want, dude. And call me. <laughs> and me too. Call me. I think it does affect, to some extent, the jobs you take as your bread and butter while you're trying to work on side projects. Just because all of us have other commitments, uh, other things that we value. Um, some of those maybe you don't value as much as you thought you did, right? Like one of the first things that I had to cut back on was my game time. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I spend much less time playing than I used to because I spend time working on games. You should and try a game with long queue times. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other thing is, you know, there are some jobs which will naturally gobble up all of your time because that's the culture of success in those industries. Now, if you want to succeed at both, some people can pull that off. Some people have the physical and mental abilities to work crazy hours and then work on 
something else on a professional level. Other people can't or don't want to. And that should inform your decision making because, again, some people can do it all. Some people can do a lot of things. Some people won't actually do very much, period. But knowing, knowing yourself and knowing how important and what you want to accomplish and what level of quality in games is very important because like if you're an investment banker, every minute you're not doing that job, you are hurting your bottom line. Now, if that doesn't matter to you and you just want to make a good living as an investment banker, you can do that. Be an investment banker. But if you want to be the best investment banker in the industry, then you just can't do both. So be realistic in what other, whatever other job you're doing because you have to know what you're going to have left creatively, emotionally, mentally, and physically while you're working on your game product because you want the game product to be worthy product. You want it to be good stuff. And or you want to do it just because it's a creative release, or you want to do it because you're honing your craft. But if you don't know what you're trying to produce, About ten minutes. you're going to have a hard time matching your, your, your other commitments. Something else that I want to say as well, you, you had bought up that you, um, that you don't have as much gameplay time. Um, I don't, generally when working on games, I don't find myself being able to play big long games either, so I usually end up playing games on this. Um, I catch a lot of flack from it from my friends because I can't play through a Pokemon campaign or I can't play through like a really big campaign because I don't have that amount of time anymore. But if, you, if you're worried about kind of keeping up playing games, it's not necessarily as, uh, it's not necessarily as kind of, uh, I can't really think of any other word other than with it or other phrase, but um, playing this does actually count as playing games as well. And I've also found uh, compartmentalizing your gaming uh, helps too. There are, you know, when I want to play a game and I'm still working on my side projects and I actually want to take a break from LOL once in a while. Right. Weird concept. <laughs> right? Um, I'll do like, I will play a game on Monday and Wednesday and work on the games the other nights. That yeah. works really yeah. well to say those are, you know, set rules on yourself yeah. to accomplish what you want. And that's the kind of stuff I do that helps me focus on getting what I want done. I also think differently about games now. Like, if I am playing a game, I cannot help but think about how are they telling the story? What are they doing right? Oh yeah, that becomes a part of your life. Like, and and <laughs> yeah. there are games that I know I would have appreciated more before because I, I, I look at this and I'm like, this is so ham-fisted, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> and there are other games that I appreciate more because they're executing very well on a premise. That, that doesn't really, in and of itself, change the quantity of time I put into games. But it has changed what I look for and my taste. Yeah. I, I would say, like, look at your goals for your game. If your goals are to make money, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you the best you, of luck. You, you, you can do just, it. You just it, make it, a match it, three it game. Is, yeah, just... It is not impossible to make money in games. You, you have to do a lot of work. A lot you of have research. to worry about things like marketing. So let's first talk to all the people whose goal is not to make money, it's to make something that's really good. Um, for those people, make a game that you want to play. Make, make, the, make a game that you want, and make, it, make a game that you can make. The game that we're making, maybe it's a little stretch on even our resources to make this game. Um, we possibly should have gone for something smaller, but we went, we went big. Um, if you're making something that you want to play, you'll probably end up playing it while you're making it, and that's game making time and game playing time all together. Um, if you're making a game where you want to make money, make a game that everybody else wants to play. You, and there, the motivation's a little harder. You've got to get your motivation from other people playing your game. So you've got to get your game into the hands of other people. Even if it's like just the person sat next to you, hey, play this, or 
going out to a meetup and getting people to, to play it. You've got to get your energy from those people because if your energy is coming from yourself on a g game that you're making for other people, you're not going to be making the best game for everybody else. That energy is going to drain pretty quick. All right. So actually, he said one thing that I wanted to follow up on that uh, is very astute, is make a game you can actually make. Um, scope control is one of the hardest, no, it is the hardest thing to do in making games. We struggle with it at Uber. Like, making a game in which you can do in the time and production capacity you have is extremely difficult. If you're making something on your own and you decide do you want to make a World of Warcraft clone, probably not a good <laughs> idea. You know, I always recommend start something that would work on a phone. You know, if that's your first game, make it make it small. Make it smaller than you want. Don't make the game you've always dreamed of first. Just because the motivation part of it, if you end up making a game that's too big, you will lose motivation halfway through because you just you won't start seeing progress and it'll just seem like too big of a mountain to climb. So keep your game small. Make tic tac toe. Yeah. The other benefit of being small is then it's done quickly. And if, if you correctly assess your skills and you can do it quickly, then you can make the next game. Right. You can always make another game. And again, finishing is really important, and it's easier to do when the game is small. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the other good thing about being a small game is you can iterate really quickly. You can take a look at it, make a change. It's not going to have a massive knock-on effect to a whole bunch of other systems that you've built and are a little hokey and clunky. You can really quickly see what will work, what won't work. We got really lucky on Nova Blitz. Um, we only iterated our combat system 12 times. 12 completely new combat systems. And we got it right the 12th time. Like, that could have taken 50 different iterations to get right um, and would still be iterating today. Cool, so we've been talking for a while, but I think we'd maybe open up to questions. I'm sure you guys would like to have something specific you'd like to know. So I believe the microphones are set up on either side. Don't so just line up and, and this, wow. this is the part where I just let you guys answer all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's got any questions for me. Oh, you'd be surprised, man. <laughs> yeah. uh, is it, are the mics on? <laughs> so this might be more for oh, Fred. Oh, there they are. are. Hello. Baby okay. switch. Baby now switch. it's way... Okay, I'll come back here. So this might be just for Fred, and if you want to do this offline afterwards, it's fine. But So I, similar to you, I suspect we both have very time-consuming and somewhat prominent day jobs. Um, that, And I'm just kind of curious about your schedule, like how many hours a day you put in at your day job, and then how you work in the night stuff and keep it up. It's a little bit tricky. Uh, because both jobs have spikes. Yeah. Uh, like if I have a court deadline, it's not unusual for me to do 12 or more hours. Yeah. And if I have a, a publishing deadline at the same time, it's going to be a painful, painful night. Um, but you do it. Yes. Wow. So you don't you don't sideline one at the, you don't make you don't take like little mini breaks from either one to compensate for when there are those spikes at one or the um, other. To, to the extent I can without compromising professional yeah. like performance yeah. on either, uh, I do. But both of them have expectations that are <clears throat> like you have to be above this level, right. period. Right. And so a lot of it is like on the the L five R side, they know that I have a day job. So I will say I have to get this draft. You have to give me this draft by this day, or I cannot turn it around. Right. Sometimes because the authors that work under me have real lives too, they can't do it, in which case it's time to get creative or miss sleep, or this week the fiction will be late because of work. To you, particularly when you have competing commitments, there are going to be times where in the real world something has to slip, but you treat your commitments professionally. And that means a level of solemnity and formality and dedication to your craft and to the output. So yeah, there are times where I work really, really, really long hours, but there's also times where just I, I'm a human being and if I've worked super long and I'm exhausted, I can't do good creative work. 
And I don't know if any of you, like, you might also have some similar things. Mm -hmm. Well, I've, I've... Thanks. Were you talking to me? Yeah, 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 I was. So, uh, I mean, you're, you're, running, you're uh, running your own business. I then... tend to, uh, I schedule a lot, and I'm very acutely aware of things that reduce my stress level. So I, I spend 10 hours a day normally in the work process. Unfortunately, I live in Bothell and work in Bellevue, which is an hour commute each way. Oh my goodness. Um, so yeah, it's a 10 hour process, then I go home, I spend two hours with my wife and kids, they go to bed, I spend a little time with my wife, and then I go in my office and I work. And having that kind of schedule helps me do mental shifts like, okay, this is the time for this now, so I push everything else aside emotionally and mentally. Um, I also do other things that take care of my stress level, like I get a massage every other week. I play sports. I play soccer and golf. I go to the gym three days, a w three, uh, three lunches a week, that kind of stuff, that, which helps me keep focused so that when I am scheduled time to be focused on work, that's the only thing I have to worry about. And... You know, that may not work for you. The key is to find something works and keep trying different things until you do find it works. Cool. Um, all right. I, uh, I feel like it's very difficult for someone to be able to have a broad enough skill set that they can take a project all the way from start to finish all by themselves. So when it comes to finding other people to work on a project with and you're only going to be working part time, how do you recommend finding people? Do you look for other people volunteering their nights and weekends or... Do you wait until you have something good and then start contracting? Or how do you go about that? Um, when you get into contracts, generally money gets involved. Yeah. So contracting off right probably isn't the best way to do it at first. Probably find some friends. Um, find some friends or make some friends and go out and socialize and find people who you'd like to work with. Because um, especially when you're not, when money's not involved, fit, it kind of becomes a little bit more important. Because even when you're working on a project, regardless of whether or not it's volunteer, there's going to be team conflicts. And you got to be with somebody who you know that you can trust them enough to, uh, to resolve it and to see you more as the person, not just the conflict itself. <laughs> there is a huge importance that gets overlooked in networking. Yes. Um, if you're trying to get into the industry, and I'm not exaggerating, half of your job is networking. There is industry nights, there are meetups in nearly every city. Uh, get involved, find out where those are, make sure you get on the invite lists, come to meet people. And that's, it's, when somebody asks me how do I get in the industry, half of it, 50% is have a good demo and a good resume. The other half of it is network. Go out to, if you're in the Seattle area, there is an east side industry night, there is a west side industry night every single month where people in the industry and trying to get in the industry just hang out socially. Um, there's a Seattle's Indies party every week, every month. Every month. Um, they still don't right? There, whatever city you're in, find these things. Um, the IGDA often has meetups, um, that and that's a great way to meet people because often if they're like you and really want to do that, uh, get in the industry or build a game on the side or that sort of thing, that's a great place to meet people. Yeah, and if if you want, to, if you're starting out making games, the best place to start out making games is go to a game jam. Lots yeah, of them organized. Are amazing. Yeah, if you if you're trying to break into the industry, networking, making games, game jam, and game jam is part of networking too. Yeah, uh, yeah, it certainly can be. Ludum Dare or Ludum Dare, Ludum Dare. which yeah. is a terrible, <laughs> terrible name, but they run a, a weekend game, game jam every six months, and it's excellent experience for anybody making games. And something else, you say you don't have all the skills, shrink your scope, make, make Pong, make something that you can make with the art you can create and the audio you can find. So just make anything. Thank you. Okay, let's see if I can move this down. So agile development's awesome, and one of the reasons um, I think it could work really well is it forces you to break things down and plan ahead to some extent, but with room for flexibility. In terms of making a game, breaking into the industry, what recommendations would you have for breaking down the game making, design, gameplay process into manageable um, chunks that fit into agile development stories? I, I would say it depends entirely on the type of game you're making. The most important thing is figure out how little work you can do to get to something that's playable. Like, you've got to get to playable 
really, 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 really quickly. Like, if you can't do that in 1% of the time available for making the game, you're going to be in trouble because you're not going to be able to spend enough time improving it. So start with getting to something that's playable, even if it's just, I've got a character that's running across the screen. Like, that's the start of playable. Then you can add jumping or add shooting or whatever else you need to add. Um, when you're getting into breaking it down design, um, <clears throat> again, go small, small features, because uh, that way you can, you can have a pink block running across the screen, and then, okay, I need animation and art for that pink block, and then you kind of know how it's going to flow, and it'll, it'll give the artist a little bit more, a little bit more help, but don't look too far down the road, that's a key part of Agile. And small, small, small chunks is the is the way I would recommend it. There's lots of other ways of doing it. Um, this is a personal recommendation, not necessarily the way of doing it. So I guess follow up question: If for those of you who also code or in, um, have done software development, would you say what is the big difference between developing a game and developing in a traditional, uh, tr more traditional software environment? Um, I could, I could, I could answer to that. Um, generally, developing a game interaction-wise is much more intense than developing an actual than developing general software. Because in general software, a lot of there's a there's a specific purpose for these interactions to uh, to exist. So, like, if you're developing a, a, a news aggregate app for a mobile phone that just kind of displays the news, there are interactions that are involved with that, and those each have a purpose for being there. When you're talking about developing a game, you don't talk about specific interactions. You talk about probability spaces. And those probability spaces can either be really small or really gigantic, depending on the game that you play. That depends on the scope. That depends on the quality that you want to give to the player. And that generally depends on the team that you have. So when it comes to doing actual code for those games, you're not necessarily coding to produce one thing. You're coding to produce one thing and then making sure that whatever else the player does doesn't break. So it's like one thing and then a ton of other stuff around it. And everybody you're working with will have an opinion. Yes. <laughs> and everybody yes. you're not working with will also have an opinion. Yes. That's one of the things I want. And, <laughs> and they will, I have actually banned the word at Uber when people say um, this is not fun. I refuse to use the word fun because it is not defined. It is nebulous. You, uh, my favorite response is people say, well, th this isn't fun. We do this, it'd be more fun. And I'd say, how many more points of fun is it? <laughs> and they laugh. But that's, you know, but that's the thing. Like, everybody has their own definition of fun. And so when you're building a game, you're going to get all this feedback, but it's like, okay, well, that person doesn't like this part of the game because they're not collectors or they're not achievement people or that kind of thing. That's another thing um, about being about being on any team. Be okay with taking feedback. Just make sure that whatever feedback you're taking is feedback that you can actually use. Um, because a lot of people will tell you that it's not fun, and they will try to give you a reason. But you know, like like you said, fun is a very nebulous word that nobody has really defined. Um, be okay with taking feedback, and then. Oh god, I forgot it. I'm <laughs> sorry. Basically, read the Steam forums, and if yes. you can handle anything they're saying, you'll be all right. <laughs> Thank you. That was about 50 fun. Okay. <laughs> hey guys. Uh, so, the question I have is, if, say for example, we have a I, IP of a game that we've thought through and had a whole process together, but none of us are designers or developers. We just like playing games. What's the process, is there a process, to going to a smaller indie studio and actually pitching the game because maybe we really like their work and we think this would be like right up their alley? I didn't quite completely So what get I think I think the question asked was that if you're if you're on if you are part of a smaller IP and you want to pitch to a bigger company, like what would the process be? Yeah. Right? Am I understanding correctly? Yeah, no, that's that's right. Like we have a game idea. You mean like but we don't know how to build you it. You mean like a single person pitching to a company like Uber or Uber pitching to a company like Microsoft? No. Like a single person or like a group of like three people that have an idea for this game and we fully baked it out, but we have no idea how to go build it. Um, don't. <laughs> generally, uh, generally, we I mean we we're, we build games because we want to build the games we want to make. I don't want I don't want to make your game. I want you to make yeah. your game. Um, it's probably a great game. I want to play it, but I don't want to build it. And I want to build the games I want to make. So if you want to pitch to a company like me. 
I, you'd be hard to press to find anybody who's willing to do that. Um, yeah. it really, it's all about making it yourself. Uh, a game, the whole idea that I have a game idea and I can pitch it to another company and they'll build it for me, never ever happens. It, there, there might be a great idea, but a lot of people have great ideas. 90% of building a game is executing on that idea. I can take a mediocre idea and build a great game out of it. And I can also take an amazing idea and build a shitty game out of it. It's the execution is what's important. And that that is that's the core of why somebody pitching me a game idea just doesn't really work. Can I can I say something that's oh, do you want to? Go ahead. Uh, can I I just wanted to say something um, about who here is familiar with Unity? With Unity 3D? Okay, so this 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 is kind of coming out of left field. But use plugins. Um, if you, <laughs> oh no, he's laughing. We were just talking. About he's this laughing. Beforehand. We were just talking about this. Um, use plugins. They're there for a reason, and it's kind of a waste of time if you're trying to make this gigantic audio engine or some big interaction yourself when there's a plugin there that has been tried and tested and true. And so I, I, that's why I wanted to bring it up. I wanted to talk about prototyping. Um, if you're trying to prototype and there's a plugin that can help you with that, then use it if it's well worth your time. And then also something I wanted to mention that's not necessarily talked about as much, depending on the type of game that you're trying to make, a paper prototype is also a prototype. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be code, it's recommended that it's code because that is what moves quicker, but if you for some reason can't code or you just don't know how to do it or you just can't you know, produce it fast enough, then a paper prototype can work, just not as well. And not just paper, too. I worked with, when I was at Gaspard Games, I worked with an artist who prototyped his game by in uh, 3D Studio Max by animating it so that we could all see how it would work, and that was effective. So there's that ways as well. That and then, you know, like storyboards, you know, storyboards of interactions, like this happens and then this is how it affects. Okay, so we have about eight minutes left, so let's try to do a sort of a lightning round and get through as many questions as we can here. Uh, earlier, you were mentioning some of the free tools that were available. Can you uh, quickly go into a little more depth on that? List a few of them that you'd recommend and what they do. Uh, free tools for what? For game development. Unity. Uh, Unity. Or, what, yeah. or Trello, or whatever the ones yeah. you were so talking about. What those do. Unity or Unreal mm -hmm. as your game engine or game maker. There's a bunch of engines out there. Use one. Um, Trello is a great project management team tool. Um, the Google Docs is amazing. There's a few uh, more. Yeah, the, the, there are more. You should not need to pay for any tool to make your game. Visual Studio 2015 is now free as well. Yeah, it's now free. There's a community edition yeah. that you know people yeah. you can download for free. Um, let's see. I don't know if it's as free anymore. I remember it being though, but there is Construct too as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's, the, a, there's a free version. There's but a free. There is a free version, but yeah, con there's Construct too. Yeah. Blender. Blender. Blender's Blender. another one. Um, let's see. Yeah, that, that's enough that that should get you started yeah. pretty quickly. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, another one I want that's, I just remembered, Twine. Uh, Twine. If you like making interactive fiction style games, like choose your own adventure style games, Twine yeah. is a great one to use because it's, it's, you need to know a little bit of HTML, but uh, it has like a node design sort of thing. Uh, I use Bitbucket. Bitbucket and GitHub. GitHub. Yeah. Uh, yeah, with source tree as a front end. It's yeah. really handy. Source tree is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I think we all use that. Uh, so we've now mentioned the collision between employment contracts with real day jobs and side projects. Any pro tips for renegotiating those clauses out of your real employment contract? <laughs> oh, I, I, I have a tip. Actually, oh. yeah. Well, sorry, go ahead. Good yeah. luck. Good luck. <laughs> what, if they're willing to hire you, then you have something luck, that they need. Good luck, but at the same time, if it's important to you, Absolutely bring yeah. it up yeah. because a lot of companies are like, yeah, this is our process, but that's just because they put it in there and didn't think about it. Um, if you get into a company and, and see that, say, hey, I want this negotiated out, and I'd say you've got a 50-50 chance in them being, okay, yeah, sure, we'll take it out of there. Yeah. So but, yeah, but, absolutely bring it up. Yeah. But, but, but before you go into that, know where you stand on that yeah. because don't go into that saying I want to renegotiate it when you actually don't know if that's a deal breaker for you. Because they will steamroll you. <laughs> because they may they may say, okay, will you take a pay cut for this? And you need to know for yourself whether that's acceptable or not. Your answer to that question should be no, because if they're asking you to take a pay cut, 
expected to do that, yeah. then they're probably not a good company to work for. Yeah. 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 Right. But you need to have thought about it. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. And also, uh, sorry, real quick, uh, non-compete clauses. Yes. If you see a non-compete, tell them to remove that out of there because non-competes are. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> what would you say is the most ambitious project you've ever taken as a developer, or the most work you've ever been given in a short amount of time to do? The day after Gen Con, I had to start working on the story prize for Gen Con. Um, that would mean that the story team lead and I were working on it literally while he was carpooling home and I was jet lagged. I think we turned it around in two days. And the fans liked that story. So that was probably the worst, contextually, it wasn't the worst, most work I've had to do. <laughs> But it was contextually the worst. Yeah, that works yeah. as well. Yeah. I, I, would, I would say building, I'm going to go totally physical here. Building access and allies miniatures. We had to design, build, manufacture a game in six months to hit Gen Con from China. Sculpting miniatures, everything. I got one. It was insane. The game won an Origins Award, which was amazing given the tiny amount of design time that was allowed. Uh, I got one um, as well. It's, it's not necessarily as big, but um, in in up to the point where we were able to release our first prototype of Alicor Princess Blast, uh, something in the game broke. Um, this was like the night before the convention. So me, the lead programmer and the lead artist, had to completely redo the first level. And so I had to get my hands dirty and script, and it was a nightmare. We basically stayed up all night, and we were walking zombies in the morning. And I had to go and lead a VIP guest around. <laughs> so I had to put on a smile, even though I had nothing to eat for like two days. <laughs> Mine is just the last week of every game I've ever shipped. <laughs> <laughs> So you were speaking earlier about sort of keeping up motivation and getting passionate about a project and also like making the sacrifices. Um, but how, uh, I don't really know how to go into this, but like um, I'm currently working on a volunteer project and you know, nine times out of 10, I'm like, yes, I'm in it. I'm willing to take this time. Except when they keep scheduling meetings that I have to physically keep canceling my social life and my social obligations. And I find myself more and more having this nasty little voice at the back of my head that's like, you're not paying me for this. Why am I, like, you know, that this is, feels above and beyond. How do I either silence or process that kind of frustration when working uh, on a part-time sort of volunteer project? Like that feeling of, like, I really want to work on this project, but, you know, this, this prioritization is you know, not working for me in terms of social versus the meetings and stuff. Is that for everybody or were you looking for a specific? Uh, uh, everybody. <laughs> um, visuals, uh, visual feedback is generally a good way to silence that voice. So what I have found when working on Alicorn Princess Blast, um, is we, we've recently begun doing like just surveys to get feedback from the game. And there's a positive section in that survey about, hey, what do you like the most about the game? And um, for me personally, looking at that positive section can often get rid of that frustration. On in terms of other projects, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a bit of a long way around. But look at where the project started and then how it progressed, um, because sometimes you can generally find that that might alleviate some frustration too. That you're not necessarily just working for the sake of working; that you're working on getting something somewhere. Um, so looking at everything in perspective as well and the part that you contribute to the team and how important you are is also kind of good at alleviating that frustration. And I'm not, I'm saying that like it's easy. That's actually really, really hard. Um, it's even harder when you're working on a volunteer project and you don't have money and you have other obligations. Um, but that's something you kind of got to try to struggle and you know get in there, get intact. I, I would also address the problem head on. Like that talk, too. talk to the person who's scheduling the meetings let them know that you've got some conflicts. See if there's another, maybe they can schedule them a different time, maybe they can't. Maybe there's ways that they can get you the information you need in some other way where you don't always have to attend the meetings and you can, you can bounce out. Most people are pretty reasonable, especially when they're working with other volunteers. Like, they're respectful of people's time and they'll, they'll go out of their way to 
figure out a way to, to schedule things around people's time as much as they can. Well, when you're working with volunteers, it feels like you kind of have to be respectful with their time. Yeah, they, yeah, you, they can just leave. You can, <laughs> yeah, uh, they can just leave. Another thing you do is uh, merge the different things. Like, if you want social time, merge it with a, making your game. You know, that's what game jams are all about. It's right. half social yeah. and half game making. Get your friends to make a game and meet up at a coffee shop and all make the game together. Make that your social time along with making game. You could do stuff like that. Right. Cool. So oh. that is everything. Thank you so much for coming out and have a good PAX. Thank you, everybody.